Natalia looks at Barry and feels immensely heavy. She knew that he was under so much pressure. It wasn't easy for him to expose everything from the past like this. He wasn't giving Carl any way out. But how could he do that while leaving a way out for himself? After all these years, Eastgate doing further investigation was inevitable, and all of them might be implicated. Natalia really wanted to stand beside Barry at this time, even if he didn't say anything to her. She just wanted to hold his hand tightly. However, because of the current situation, she could only stand there, watching the overwhelming pressure he was experiencing. At this time, Carl's face had no color. He knew that Barry had made up his mind. He also knew that from the moment he stepped into this situation, he had stepped into a trap that Barry had arranged for a long time. He glared at his son, his eyes scarlet, and he couldn't believe that it had come to this. He had been betrayed by the son whom he had trusted so much not long ago. However, Barry wasn't affected by the hatred in Carl's eyes. When he looked at the crowd, his face was still calm. Behind him was a photo of Cheryl. Cheryl's smile in the photo made her appear gentle and kind. Her eyes were clear, and it seemed to be a support to Barry. As for the Harris and Thompson families, you know how big they were. They not only had the same success, but both disappeared so quickly. Of course, the most obvious thing was that they both had a relationship with the same person, Carl. How ridiculous that Carl told the media more than once about his friendship with them and about his deep love for my mother over and over. What really happened, though? They were both intentionally framed and destroyed. Barry's voice was calm, his eyes were firm, and his words were like thunder throughout the room. It made the scene suddenly explode. Was that all really designed by Carl? God, I can't even think about the possibility. Didn't Carl take Pedro's daughter in? I remember very clearly that at that time, everyone at Eastgate was scolding him for that. After all, he had a big business, which was related to the life and death of so many people. And he suddenly went bankrupt and even committed suicide after bankruptcy. Didn't expect it was designed, said one person. And the Thompson family. That accident was also very sudden. My God! Wasn't Carl the son-in-law of the family? How can you do something like this? Asked another. Do you have any evidence? That's a big accusation. Commented another. Looking at the people, Barry replied. Both Pedro and my grandfather were first-class entrepreneurs. What they did wrong was to blindly believe Carl. A liar. I sent all the relevant information to the police, and they will follow up with an official investigation. He went on. Now it is time to let the events of that year be made public. What's more, it should be known that Pedro did not commit suicide. He did not choose to leave his wife and daughter because he was cowardly and couldn't bear the responsibility. As the media and public opinion said, he didn't want to give up at all. He wanted to start again. But Carl didn't give him the chance. Instead, he killed him and made it look like an accident. Right, Carl? Barry's sharp eyes suddenly fell on Carl, and Carl twitched all over. Carl was afraid. He did all of those things, and they constantly shuttled back and forth in his mind. But now Barry even knew that he had killed Pedro, too. Pedro's figure appeared again in his mind. Oh, how he had envied Pedro. Why? His own family background was obviously much better than Pedro's. But Pedro had started from scratch, yet his career was even better than Carl's. And he had so many more friends than Carl did. Carl couldn't bear such a thing. The strong background of his family gave him a strong sense of self-esteem since he was young. However, he had learned that no matter how good his background was, and no matter what his financial resources were, he was still not worth much when compared to Pedro. Therefore, Carl took the initiative to make friends with Pedro, and became his best friend. Knowing that Pedro valued righteousness, Carl had known that he would undoubtedly believe anything he said. At first, Carl just wanted to make Pedro go bankrupt so that he could taste failure. However, even after that happened, Pedro had still been in high spirits and had simply planned to make a comeback. 
the outcome had been totally different than what Carl had been aiming for. He didn't get to see Pedro look like a dog at all. Therefore, he had pushed Pedro to hurt him and had then pretended that it had been suicide. After that, he took Natalia and her mother in to look good. For so long, he had gotten away with it. But now, everything that he worked so hard to manage was going to be destroyed. Natalia stood aside, biting her lips, trying to hold back her tears. But the burst of pain created tears that she couldn't control. After so many years of sadness over her father's death and her mother's hatred, she was finally getting the revenge she had been waiting for. Her mother, who had endured the aftermath of Carl's plotting for so long, had been consumed by hatred. She and her mom had both suffered greatly because they had to watch Carl, the culprit, in high spirits for so long. They were desperate because they were powerless to go against him. So they had been forced to pretend that they didn't know the truth and had suffered in the dark. Even today, if someone were to search the news related to Pedro back then, they could still find the reports of Pedro from that time. They all said that he had been a cowardly, irresponsible, selfish man and a failed entrepreneur. But the facts were not like that. Her father had really been an indomitable man. Even though he had been betrayed and lost everything, he had still been determined to come back rather than give up. However, Carl had been so cruel that he refused to give her father such a chance. But now the truth had finally been exposed. Natalia could see a photo she had of her parents in her mind. It was a photo that her mother had hidden away. In it, she and Pedro were smiling tenderly and sweetly at each other. If they were still alive, they would probably still be smiling like that. Suddenly, Carl yelled, I didn't do that. You're talking nonsense. Carl knew that if he gave up now, he would not only lose his reputation, but also go to prison. For such a long time, he and Marie had lived with peace of mind. Carl had long forgotten everything about what he had done, and he hadn't been affected by it at all in a long time. He had been so sure that no one would ever find out. That's why he had been so arrogant with Natalia, boasting about his love and righteousness. But now everything was being exposed. The police will decide that. Today, I just wanted to make it clear in front of everyone here that they were wrong in their judgments of the two families you destroyed. Barry replied in a deep voice. Carl was trembling all over, and his angry eyes were still staring at Barry when he said, You are crazy. You're going to destroy me just for a woman? Do you think that will be good for you? Do you know if something happened to me, Eastgate would also be implicated? You must be joking. After all of my hard work for so many years, Barry, you have lost your mind. Yes, I have a lot to lose, but at least I will be able to live with my own conscience. Barry said coldly. Barry then said to everyone, Carl is a hypocritical man, and he caused my mother's death. As for the affairs of the Thompson and Harris families, all future investigations will be public. I'm sorry to have delayed you all today, but the families have suffered for so long. It was time for them to be redeemed. Carl stood in place in a daze and looked at all the people's disgust and heard their comments. He wanted to crawl into a hole, but he could only sit in his wheelchair and bear it. The chatter kept coming into his ears, almost driving him mad. Carl had always been mostly concerned about his reputation. It was for this reason that he always hyped himself up to the media. He praised himself and accepted praise eagerly from the outside world. But now everything had been ruined. If everything Barry knew had been handed over to the police, his whole life would have been ruined. And his destruction was being done by his own son. Carl stared at Barry with hatred in his eyes. He clenched his teeth and roared fiercely. What are you doing to me? I treated you as a good son and believed everything you said. I even made plans to leave Eastgate to you. How about you? You betrayed me. Why? Carl's roar was angry and aggressive. Is it very painful? Barry asked with a laugh. He then added, Have you ever thought about how it felt to all those people who were betrayed by you? 
Do you think you should get away with it all? Carl, nothing can compare to what you did. The time had come for retribution. Carl stood still as he looked at Barry rigidly. The expression on his face was priceless. Meanwhile, Marie was standing beside him, looking desperate with her face full of tears. She looked embarrassed and pathetic. Barry looked at them both. He then turned around and looked at the picture of his mother. His back was straight, and his broad shoulders were no longer as tense as before. Natalia couldn't see the expression on his face, but she could feel his deep sadness just by looking at his back. At this moment, Natalia felt the emotions he was experiencing, because she felt the same way herself. If their relatives were still alive, this would be a happy moment. However, they weren't, and they would never be coming back. Natalia forced herself to stay composed. At this moment, there was no one else in her eyes. There was no humiliated Carl or embarrassed Marie. There were no other people in the room who were shocked by the scene. All she saw was Barry, so she walked up to him slowly. She went to his side and grabbed his hand. A moment later, the sound of the police car sounded out. Carl and Marie were handcuffed and in full view of the public, were taken away by the police with reporters taking photos. Emily took the initiative to stand up, contacted the security guards, and sent the guests away one by one. The event which had been planned for so long was finally complete. Natalia personally walked Karsten and Sloan out. As Pedro's old friends, they were teary-eyed and emotional. But in the end, they swallowed most of their words and emotions. Instead, they patted Natalia on the shoulder, and Sloan said to her in a soft voice, Great work, Natalia. Your father is looking down on you, and he is proud. But you have to remember you have gotten revenge. But now you have to live your own life. You must be happy. That's what your father would want the most. Yes, I will. Natalia said as she bit her lip and nodded. After that, the huge auditorium held only Barry and Natalia, and Emily and Eric. The four looked at each other and were speechless for a moment. Finally, Emily sighed and said in a low voice, You two have been planning this for so long. You must be exhausted. Go home and get some rest, because we still have a battle to fight. We... Natalia stopped and her expression was very tense. What should have been done had been done, and the next step was to solve the problems caused by it all. The most important thing was that it would certainly affect Eastgate, and it would also be important to finish the projects they were working on quickly. Although Barry had tried his best to catch up on the project schedules, he wasn't able to guarantee that the project would be completely completed before news of the incident broke out. What's more... They hadn't warned Eric and Emily prior. It's my fault, this. I didn't inform you sooner because I was so focused on exposing the truth. As for our project, Eastgate will bear all the losses caused by our project together. I will ask our attorneys to draw up a contract as soon as possible. And Eastgate will also pay 12% interest on our project. Barry said in a low voice. His face wasn't as calm as before. He looked really tired. Immediately, Barry bowed deeply to Eric and added in a low voice, I'm sorry. I tried to consider everything, but I had to make a choice. The reason why I didn't tell you was not distrust, but that I wasn't 100% sure about how it would work out. If you're not satisfied with my suggestions, we can talk about it. Currently, Barry is speaking to Eric and Emily as a friend. Natalia sighed and added, We are very sorry. This was the best solution we could think of. They both knew that if Eric and Emily were angry, it would be reasonable. After all, they had concealed it from them, which affected their work interests. However, they were both more worried about losing them as friends than the business. Natalia lowered her head and sighed deeply. She was worried that Eric and Emily wouldn't forgive them. At this time, Natalia felt warmth on her head. She raised her head blankly and saw Emily's gentle eyes. You have undertaken a lot lately. Eric and I understand the pressure you were under, and we understand why you made this choice. As for the impact on our project, we will do our best to help, 
It's not a problem to postpone the project for a while. Emily said softly. After that, she held Natalia in her arms and gently patted her on her back. She then added, Today was a hard day. You have been waiting and planning for it for a long time. Now what you need is some rest, and then we can figure out how to deal with the follow-up. Natalia was surprised. She blinked her eyes and asked Emily blankly, Are you not angry? Why would I be angry? Emily asked with a chuckle. She then said, From the beginning, Eric and I believed in you, and so we now naturally understand. Besides, I had a vague premonition before I came here today that this was going to happen. Although I didn't expect it to be so big, and I definitely didn't expect Carl to be so vicious. Natalia's eyes filled with tears as she hugged Emily tightly and said, You're so nice! Emily comforted her with a smile. After the conversation, Emily left with Eric. After all, they did have to prepare to deal with all of their urgent matters. Barry and Natalia followed Emily's advice and headed home. On the way, the two looked at each other. Along the ride, they didn't speak for a long time. Natalia felt overwhelming exhaustion at first, but now she was feeling great joy that everything was finally over. The emotional ups and downs were draining, but she was so proud of them. Everything had gone according to plan, and they had finally exposed Carl's true face in public. And Eric and Emily weren't mad at them at all. It felt like a dream, but it had all really happened. Natalia couldn't control her mood more. She buried her head in Barry's palm and began to cry silently. So much waiting, and now it was all over. She no longer needed to pretend in front of Carl that she didn't know the truth. And her father's name no longer needed to bear the curses and wrongs that had been done to him. As of today, everyone knew that he wasn't a coward at all. Natalia cried and cried. She didn't make a sound but her straight shoulders, trembling hands, and hot tears dripping on Barry's palm were enough to tell him how she was feeling. At this time, Barry didn't say anything. All he could do was hold Natalia tightly and comfort her. As Barry had designed, the public opinion began to reach its peak after the world learned of today's events. Barry was the most famous of all in Eastgate, and every move of his attracted much attention. Everything Carl had done was being exposed, which naturally attracted attention and made headlines everywhere. As a result, everyone knew that families and lives had been destroyed by Carl's hands, and that he had still been pretending to be a good man all these years. Marie's horrible acts were also made known. On top of it, all of these things had been announced on the 10th anniversary of Barry's mother's death, leaving no way for her and Carl to repair it. The media followed Barry's wishes, releasing stories one topic after another, which helped clear the names of the affected families. The photos of Carl being taken away in handcuffs had also been on the front page of all magazines and papers. All the people who worked at Eastgate saw the news. The public opinion that Carl cared so much about had completely turned on him. After a short rest, Barry quickly rushed to Eastgate, where there was a series of things waiting for him to deal with. As expected by Barry, Public opinion was rising constantly. Naturally, everyone at the office was constantly discussing the news about Carl. All eyes were on Barry when he arrived. He frowned and called Director Moses to his office. What's the atmosphere like? Has the progress of all our projects been affected? He asked him in a deep voice. Since Carl himself was the chairman of the board of directors of Eastgate, it would be impossible for there to be no impact. Now Barry had to do all he could to minimize their losses. Most people are just shocked and worried about whether it will affect their jobs. However, you also know that this is a group that was founded by Carl, and there are many of his confidants still working here. Most of them are afraid. I think you should hold a meeting and tell the public relations department how to deal with it all. After all, some people have begun to buy into the media's hype about how this is going to cause Eastgate major problems. Director Moses quickly said. He then sighed. 
Director Moses truly admired Barry's courage from the bottom of his heart. After all, not everyone would be willing to take such a big risk for justice. The projects are still okay at present, but there will likely be problems that arise. To tell you the truth, some team members have received calls from their partners today, and we are very worried about it. I am also worried that there will be an investigation into the company, Director Moses said. Barry nodded. He then looked up at Director Moses and said in a low voice, I will hold a meeting later and tell the public relations department that I want to hold a press conference. In addition, please get me the contact information for all of the partners on every project we are working on at present. I want to personally apologize to them all. Director Moses took a deep look at Barry. His courage to take this all on was something he knew he wouldn't be able to handle himself. What's the latest with Carl? Had the investigation begun? He then asked. Yes, the police have already begun to investigate because of the abundant evidence. His prosecution is certain. Carl has been involved in so many awful things. He will likely get the death penalty or life imprisonment. Barry replied. This made Director Moses tremble with fear. Are you going to see him? Director Moses asked tentatively. Barry shook his head and replied, This is not the time. He did need to see Carl, but not now, because there are more important things to deal with right now. Shortly after, Barry held an emergency meeting with the public relations department and arranged for a time to hold the press conference. The public was going wild and had much to say about the recent events. Carl is a murderer. He harmed his wife and friends. Last month, I saw his interview. He was boasting about how he was such a great philanthropist. I'm really sickened by this. It's disgusting. It seems that there is no normal person in the whole family. Marie is awful too. Carl killed his friends and left those two families in ruins with his actions. I am also disgusted. My father worked for Pedro's company. He lost his job because of their bankruptcy. After so many years of hard work, he was wasted and depressed for a long time. There are a lot of people like us. At first, I blamed Pedro, but it was the famous Carl who caused it all. From today on, we should all boycott Eastgate. Since his father was involved in such horrible acts, the public was also turning against Barry. They felt he was no longer worthy of being the pride of Eastgate. Moreover, because there were a lot of dignified people present when Carl was shamed, many had no interest in working with such a tainted enterprise. Others decided to wait to see how things would work out. Barry observed the change against him in public opinion as he prepared for the press conference in hopes it would help. That afternoon, Barry took Director Moses and other trusted senior officials to visit the owners of other companies they worked with in person. At present, there are more than a dozen companies that Eastgate is working with. At each meeting, Barry personally apologized and assured them that he would solve the public opinion crisis soon. He also explained how he strived to make everything return to normal as soon as possible. Because of his sincere apologies, many partners didn't make excessive demands. Next, he had to deal with the important crisis of the public opinion. He prepared for the press conference and invited many reporters. Natalia attended the press conference with him. Reporters from all news and media stations in the area attended. Barry selected the venue himself and had even worked with reporters to help prepare the questions. Barry knew that the press conference would be critical to effectively manage the fallout. Natalia confirmed the list of reporters. She clenched her fists and sighed. She looked very nervous. Yesterday, she had rested at home at Barry's insistence. In fact, he didn't want her to come to the press conference today, but Natalia couldn't stay away. She felt that she had to stand by his side to shoulder the responsibility with him. After all, they both had designed and participated in their plan together. Everything is ready. The reporters are all set. The live broadcast is live, so hopefully it will go as planned. If not, it will be hard for us to recover. The manager of the public relations department said, Okay, Natalia said as she nodded. 
she fully understood how important this press conference was, and also understood Barry's reasons for having it. With the help of the press conference, they should be able to present Eastgate in a more positive light, and remove the company from being implicated in Carl's wrongdoings. Plus, their relationships with their current partners seem stable, but they had to look forward as well. They didn't only have to worry about their current projects, but also their future projects. After all, many people were holding a wait-and-see attitude. They wanted to see how Barry would solve the public opinion storm he had caused himself. One can only imagine how much pressure Barry was bearing on his shoulders right now. The countdown to the press conference began. Natalia took a deep breath and quickly stepped onto the prepared stage beside Barry. Barry was wearing a clean black suit. He looked very thin. His face and eyes looked tired, but it didn't impact his handsome. He was very used to being in the spotlight, so he faced the reporters and dealt with their continuous cameras flashing in his face with poise. He then began, I've troubled you all to come here today because I want to make clear to everyone the situation with Eastgate. Even though Barry was tired, his voice sounded sonorous and powerful, and his eyes were incomparably resolute, which everyone felt. Carl Sinclair, the chairman of Eastgate, has been in the media lately due to his past actions coming to light. At present, the police are doing an investigation into those actions. As soon as there is any news on their investigation, we will be the first to know, he said. Barry's voice was calm and steady. He looked at the reporters under the stage and opened his mouth again, saying, And Eastgate will fully cooperate with the police in the investigations. The reason for this press conference is to tell you that the success of Eastgate over the past few decades was due to the joint efforts created by every manager and worker at the company. Everyone who knows the whole story also knows that a large part of Eastgate's resources came from the Thompson and Harris families. As their successor, I will stick to their ideas and make Eastgate's bigger and better. Facing the reporters, Barry bowed deeply. His back was very thin and his shoulder blades were protruding, which made him look a bit depressed. But when he looked up, his eyes were firm as before. I will manage Eastgate from here on out, and I can guarantee that everything we do will be to win back the public's trust. I hope that you will give us that chance. Carl Sinclair is not innocent, but the rest of us here at Eastgate are, he added. What Barry was trying to do was clearly not for himself, but for everyone else who had been committed to Eastgate for years and years. Natalia knew exactly what Barry was thinking. Although he had changed a lot recently, he still knew how to hide himself and calculate the reactions of others. But he was still the gentle, kind man she loved. While Barry thought that Carl should pay the price, he knew that he would have to shoulder the pressure and rely on his own ability to start over again so that Eastgate could become different than it was before. And Carl would no longer be involved. Natalia respected Barry's choices and felt very proud of him. After the press conference, the online discussions quickly began. Of course, most of them were about Carl. After all, what Carl had done was awful, and people were appalled. On their way home, Natalia took out her phone to see what people were saying. As soon as she did, her eyebrows immediately wrinkled up. Although everything had been explained clearly at the press conference, the public was still distrustful of Eastgate. Don't look at that, Barry said as he closed Natalia's phone and added, We can't force people to change their minds instantly. After all, Carl was involved with Eastgate for a long time. We have to give them some time to process it all. Natalia frowned and replied, But if it continues like this for too long, it will affect our projects. Are you afraid I am wrong? Barry asked her, as he kneaded her cheek in a gentle and doting way. Of course not. It's a big deal. But if we have to, we will just start from scratch. Even if there is no Eastgate after this, we will recover. I believe in your abilities, it's just... Natalia stopped and looked up at Barry with worry in her eyes. She knew that he couldn't just leave Eastgate behind. She then added in a low voice, I'm just worried about you. You're exhausted from all of this. These days, Barry spent all of his time planning and had run himself ragged. Barry smiled and kissed Natalia's forehead gently. He then said, 
None of it even matters as long as you are by my side. I'll always be with you, of course, forever. Natalia said as she held his hand and looked at him deeply. No matter how difficult things became, she would never leave his side. Originally, Natalia thought that after revealing what Carl had done, things would be more relaxed, which would at least allow her to sleep peacefully. But there were still so many things they would have to deal with. The impact of the press conference wasn't as good as they had hoped, but the public relations department was doing its best to make up for it. However, what Carl has done has caused such great public anger that it would be hard to offset that in a short period of time. At least some people on the internet were saying that Barry's actions had been respectable, but most saw it a different way. Natalia looked at the comments on the internet again. She was so upset that she couldn't eat. She wanted to argue against the comments to make people see how wrong they were. Over the next few days, Eastgate stocks began to fall, dropping them to the lowest stock price since the establishment of the company. This was a huge blow to the company. Barry was still going to the office every day to deal with work affairs and to stay closely involved in all of their projects. He was even working nights. He knew that he needed to work hard to maintain current projects and that he had to keep the spirit of Eastgate's employees high. Natalia opened the door of the office and saw Barry's holding a pin in his hand. Although he was looking at a document, his eyes were closed. She immediately lightened her steps and frowned helplessly. Last night, Barry hadn't gone home at all. He had worked all day and night again last night. Most of the time, he was the only one in the office. Natalia had calculated that he hadn't even gotten eight hours of sleep in as many days. Although she tried to enter the office quietly, Barry still woke up. You're back? He asked her. His eyes were blurred for a moment, but immediately became clear and bright when he saw her. Natalia bit her lip as she went over and patted him on the shoulder, saying, Why don't you go home to get some sleep? I'll take care of things here. No need, Barry said as he forced himself to perk up. He began to read the documents on his desk again. I would like to help you. Although I can't do everything that you can, I can still help with many things. Natalia said softly. Barry shook his head and replied, It's okay. I don't want you to have to worry about things too much. He then rubbed Natalia's head and added with a smile, Please don't worry about me. I knew this was going to be hard, but all difficulties pass when they are faced head on. Natalia didn't expect Barry to comfort her at this time. She opened her mouth and was about to say something else when the door of the office was pushed open. Director Moses came into the room, holding a tablet in his hand. The expression on his face was obviously excited. Look, he said. Barry and Natalia looked at each other at the same time, and then looked down at the tablet that Director Moses had put on the table. It was a video of Eric. Natalia's eyes widened in surprise. Eric had always been a mysterious figure in the business world. He seldom appeared in public or on the news. He kept a low-key profile in public, even though his every business achievement was high profile. At this time, Eric, who had always been so low-key, appeared in front of the cameras, wearing a high-end, custom-made gray suit, which vividly displayed his lofty majesty. Even just on a screen, Natalia could clearly feel Eric's power. A reporter said, Sir, Eastgate has been under tremendous pressure due to public opinion recently. Not only Carl Sinclair, as chairman of the board of directors, but also his son Barry, has been the subject of much negative press. As we all know, the current project between Parkers and Eastgate is still in progress. What will be the impact of what happened with Carl on the project? What will you do? Eric picked up his eyebrows and almost appeared as if the question was a boring one. Natalia's heart sank quickly. But a moment later, Eric suddenly opened his mouth and said, our cooperation with Eastgate will not be affected by this at all. Barry Sinclair is a man of great courage. He is also a victim of what Carl has done, and it was he who exposed it all. Do you think that Barry, as the man in charge of Eastgate, didn't imagine what the consequences would be of revealing the truth? Although Eric faced the camera with a casual attitude and a light tone, his words were full of weight. He added, 
He knew what the consequences might be, but he still exposed it all. If not for him, would Carl's true face ever have been exposed? When the Parkers selected to work with Eastgate, the most important thing to us wasn't Eastgate's strong capital, but it was Barry playing a key role in our work together. Barry is an entrepreneur with a strong sense of justice and excellent abilities. I believe that under his control, Eastgate will reach the level of Parker's. Therefore, my opinion of him has only become better. Eastgate under Barry's control is a company that I want to work with, now and in the future. Our cooperation will not be affected by Carl's actions. After Eric finished, he didn't even look at the camera. He instead walked away from the reporters under the protection of his security guards. When Natalia saw it, her eyes filled with tears. She holds them back carefully, not daring to let them fall. Mr. Sinclair, I can see that you have a good relationship with Mr. Parker. It is unprecedented for him to give such a long speech in front of a reporter. This means so much for us. It's great news. Director Moses said excitedly. Barry looked at the tablet and felt out of breath for a moment. So much emotion was surging through his heart. He and Natalia would never have asked Eric to come forward on their behalf because the project was critical and they had brought a lot of trouble on him. And nobody else had stuck up for them this way. Everyone else in the business world had basically avoided Barry for fear of being implicated in Eastgate's affairs. But Eric, who rarely allowed interviews by the media, had defended them. Natalia's tears finally fell. She wiped them and said, Yes, it's so good. Yes, so good that they didn't have to face this alone. They had friends. Barry and Natalia hadn't expected Eric to speak up for them, but he did more than that. He had arranged a series of follow-up media coverage to help even more. Therefore, after Eric spoke up, the media coverage began to turn around. At this time, Parker's own media outlet also began a round of reporting mainly focusing on Barry's initiative to expose the incident, which put Barry in a good light. After this started, the online comments about Barry completely changed. Many people were talking about how they would never have the courage to expose the mess, as Barry had. Slowly, Eastgate's stock also began to turn around. All of their troubles had been fixed by Eric. Natalia had always known that Eric was fierce but she had never expected that his influence could be so great. Therefore, Natalia and Barry called Eric and Emily to thank them. They still had a lot of things to deal with at Eastgate, so they couldn't meet with them in person. I know that no matter what words I say, it will never be enough. But thank you very much from the bottom of our hearts. Barry and I will never forget it, and we will certainly return the favor one day. Natalia said sincerely, Emily was less emotional, but she was smiling when she heard Natalia's words. She said, Don't worry about that. What Eric said came from the bottom of his heart. He and I really admire your courage. He is looking forward to the future with Eastgate under Barry's control. He knows there will be a great collaboration and competition. Competition? Can't we just work together forever? Natalia asked. She was in a silly mood. Her eyes were still full of tears when she added, Really? I don't ever want to compete with you. It would be too difficult. Emily immediately laughed and replied, Well, working together would certainly be the most welcome. Seriously, Eric was happy to help. As for what comes next, I believe Barry can handle it from here. He knows better than us what to do. But remember to also make sure you are both getting some rest. I know why Eric loves you so much, Emily. You are an angel, Natalia said. Natalia felt like she had never met a person like Emily. She was such a kind woman. You're just saying that because I'm beautiful, Emily joked mischievously. Well, that too. You are the most beautiful woman I have ever seen, Natalia said back. Emily had something to deal with, so the call didn't last too long. After hanging up the phone, Natalia still has some unfinished business to take care of herself. When we get the chance, let's take them out to eat, Barry said to her in a low voice. Natalia nodded. The next thing that Eastgate had to face was the investigations by the police, 
as they cooperated with them to learn more about all that Carl had done. Barry got together all of the information the police needed on Eastgate's past projects and helped by organizing it all for them. The incidences with the Thompson and Harris families and Cheryl and Pedro's deaths also had to be investigated again. Everything was going on according to Barry's design. Along the way, Eric was also helping Barry and assisting the police. And about a week after the incident, Barry finally had time to deal with Carl on a personal level. Because so much evidence had been provided to the police, Carl was already under investigation, including the two homicide cases. Marie was also suspected of murder, as well as manufacturing a car accident. She had been arrested and was being interrogated. It was now time for Barry to meet with Carl in prison. It would be the first time they met after the night when Barry had exposed him. In the past, when Justin had been in trouble, Carl had arranged a lawyer for him, but he did not even bother to visit him. This time, Barry made his position clear to the media that he would never help hire lawyers to defend Carl. He hoped to see Carl get his retribution more than anyone else. Barry and Natalia arrived at the prison, and Carl was brought in by the guards. He looked like a changed person. Still sitting in a wheelchair and very thin, the flesh on his face seemed to have completely sunken in. I made him appear even more mean, and his usually sharp eyes seemed to have lost all their light. Natalia could immediately tell that the blow to Carl had been even greater than she had hoped to see. Carl, whose eyes were originally cloudy, became excited and angered after seeing them. If it were not for the handcuffs on his hands, the wheelchair, and the guard standing at his side, Carl might have rushed at them. But no matter how angry Carl was, he was under the custody of the police and had no freedom of movement. He was a broken man, so his hatred could only come out of his eyes. He glared at Barry and Natalia as if he wanted to kill them. What are you doing here? Carl roared fiercely. He had exhausted and used all of his strength to yell. But his voice wasn't as loud as it used to be. His world has changed completely since he had been exposed. Before stepping into the auditorium, Carl was the happiest person in the world. After all, he had such a loyal son, and his company was doing well. Plus, he was getting better, and as soon as his health allowed... He had planned to return to Eastgate immediately. At that time, he felt that everything was still under his control. But after stepping into the auditorium, everything changed. Barry's betrayal, the exposure of past events, and the fact that he had been handcuffed and taken to prison, as well as the prosecution he was now facing, put Carl in a hopeless position. The more he thought about it, the more depressed he became. He couldn't sleep or eat. After just a handful of days, he looked 10 years older. Ever since he had arrived in prison, he had been confronted with constant interrogation, and the events of the past had been placed in front of him one by one. Even if he gritted his teeth and refused to admit it, he was in big trouble. All the evidence was in the hands of the police. What other reason? We came to see you, Natalia said. She had thought about this moment for a long time, and it felt good to sprinkle salt on Carl's wound. Carl's eyes turned even more angry when he said, You planned all of this for a long time, didn't you? Damn you. When did you find out? Find out about which part? What did you do to the Thompson and Harris families? Natalia raised her eyebrows and asked sarcastically. She then said, Or about how you horribly treated my mother? You should know that my mother was still thankful for your care, and she did everything she could to give me a happy childhood. But she was actually always the one who wanted you to pay the most. Do you know how much she wanted to hold a knife to your neck after what you did? The hatred Natalia had repressed for so many years was finally breaking out at this moment. She was finally getting the chance to vent it all out straight to Carl's face. She continued, You think she knew nothing, but she knew it all. The reason why we waited and planned this for so long is because we wanted to make sure that you paid for what you have done. We wanted to make sure that everyone found out about what you have done. All you ever cared about was your reputation. And now your reputation has been completely destroyed. 
you are no longer known as a philanthropist or an entrepreneur, but as a murderer. Natalia clenched her fists while she spoke. She even began shaking. She thought of her mother and father and all they had endured. At this moment, all the hatred and the feeling of revenge mixed together, and Natalia's eyes filled with tears. But she couldn't cry, and she didn't want to cry, so she suppressed her tears. Meanwhile, Carl's face became extremely pale. What he was most afraid of was the change of his reputation. Thinking of this, he felt hopeless again. If Barry and Natalia hadn't done this to him, he would still be that bright man who had been worshipped by all. But now, he was just a man in prison, and he would have to face the highest penalty. He lived with handcuffs on his hands and was no longer free. So, you planned each and everything? Was Justin involved at all? Carl asked. He had been thinking about that a lot. Now he was asking them for confirmation. He would be devastated if Justin had been involved in the plot to take him down. Just like you, Justin is a beast. However, he is more stupid than you are and he isn't nearly as ruthless. As for him being involved in our plan, do you really think that stupid, silly son could come up with a plan at all? <laughs> I can only say that you think too highly of him. Natalia said sarcastically. Carl's body instantly became extremely cold. At this time, he knew that Justin had also stepped into Barry's trap. Barry had quietly planted everything on Justin, caused him to relax his vigilance, and had tricked him. He had also been played by Barry. At this time, Carl suddenly realized that Justin had truly been the more loyal and obedient son. So his hatred broke out again. He yelled, So you also planned Justin's imprisonment? You cruel beast! That's your brother! You ruined him! Do you still deserve Eastgate? You have destroyed everyone in the family except you. I destroy Justin? Barry asked with a sarcastic tone. He added, Justin was convicted of something he did himself. And is he my brother? Come on, give it up. Carl felt like he was going crazy on the spot. He had lived the first half of his life with the wind and water. Born with a golden spoon in his mouth, he had never suffered any setbacks. Whatever he wants, he would seize it using any means. He had felt like Pedro was more successful than he was, and he didn't want to be lesser than him. So he made sure that Pedro lost everything and had stolen his resources. He also felt like Cheryl's father had a strong sense of control. So he simply destroyed the family and inherited everything they had. Carl had always been successful, but at this time, he was sitting here in prison with the police watching his every move. And sitting opposite him were Barry and Natalia, who were acting arrogant and sarcastic. He had been forced to ask them questions that he already knew the answers to. And now he was even more humiliated. But there were still many doubts in his heart. Carl clenched his teeth and asked them in a deep voice, How did you know about the deaths of Cheryl and Pedro? The police had been interrogating Carl for several days, forcing him not to sleep because they were interrogating him night and day. Carl couldn't accept that he had been caught and that everything he had done was being exposed. Therefore, his spirit was gradually collapsing. He knew that Barry must have found exact evidence. Otherwise, how could he have described what had happened with such detail and accuracy? In the process of continuous questioning, Carl had finally admitted the two crimes. But because the two homicide crimes would carry the heaviest sentences, Carl needed to know how Barry had found out about the deaths and what kind of evidence he held in his hand. Their deaths? What do you want to know? Barry asked as he took a look at him. What evidence do you have? How did you find out? Carl then asked, staring into Barry's eyes. Barry sat motionless, looking at him and the expression on his face was particularly sarcastic when he said, You don't really think that you planned everything perfectly, do you? Did you really think that the evidence would never be found? Don't forget that there are so few animals like you. Most people aren't like you. 
As for my mother's death, I have no evidence at all. It was just my guess. As it turns out, fate was on my side, and I was able to guess correctly. No evidence? Carl shouted. His eyes widened and his face was full of shock and anger. He clenched his fists. What was even more ridiculous than Barry doing this to him was that he was now saying there was no evidence. He had no evidence at all for the two murders, but yet he had admitted he had committed the crimes. Had he just been fooled again? If he hadn't admitted it, he might have gotten off. Barry's eyes became extremely cold. Apparently, he had guessed all of the details correctly. He looked at Carl's reaction in dismay, which confirmed it all. Thinking of this, Barry's mood suddenly became extremely complicated. He had so many regrets from the day his mother had died. If he hadn't left that day, the accident might have never happened. Then his mother would still be alive. She would be able to see him getting this revenge on Carl right now. But that wasn't possible. Looking at Carl, Barry felt even more hatred for him. He just wanted to see this man be punished immediately. It would be better for him to get the death penalty, leaving no room for his release. Carl was in deep despair. He had thought Barry had found evidence, but he had only guessed. He had really fallen into his son's trap. Marie and Justin had clearly told Carl again and again that there was something going on with Barry, but he hadn't believed it at all. He had been thoroughly deceived by Barry. Now he could only stand by as he was reduced to this point, with no chance of turning back. No, he just couldn't give up. All of his glory and fame to this? He couldn't accept it. So he looked at Barry and said with a cry, Okay, I did wrong, but you can't send me to jail like this. Yes, your mother's death was my fault, but I have taken care of you since you were born. Even recently, didn't I give you Eastgate? I know you hate me for your mother's death, but I shouldn't be put in prison forever. Do you think that would be good for you? In the future, you will always have to tell people that you have a father in prison. You must think about that. And don't forget that I am your father. Carl had spoken without the hatred and anger of earlier. He now began to cry as if he had suddenly turned into an abandoned and lonely old man. Barry, please, I don't believe you don't love me at all. I am getting older. Please just allow me to live the rest of my life normally. How can I stay here when I am old and am no threat to anyone at all? Carl said through his sobs. Natalia clenched her fist tightly again. For a moment, her anger was even deeper than before. She replied, Are you kidding me? Now you think of treating Barry with the affection of father? Do you even think you deserve to be his father? She stared at Carl fiercely. She always thought that Carl was shameless, but he always stooped lower and lower. I didn't want to even talk to you about this, but you didn't deserve this. Don't you know that? She added. She then said in a low voice, since the beginning, you were only using Barry. You really wanted Justin to inherit everything, but you had no choice. You allowed Justin and Chloe to frame him and drive him out of the business. What's more, over the years, you only really cared about Justin. How can you have the face to talk about a father and son relationship right now? Carl, to tell you the truth, there is no way we will ever forgive you for all that you have done. Natalia was really angry. She had experienced so much with Barry. She knew that Carl wasn't even worthy of being his father. But now he was trying to play to his son's emotions. How could he have such nerve? Carl's face turned pale as expected. He carefully looked at Barry, who hadn't said a word. Natalia directly interrupted his thoughts when she said in a cold voice, Isn't what you care the most about your reputation and fame? On the day of your sentence, I will certainly make sure we do much media coverage of the event so that everyone can see what you have done and understand why you are being so harshly punished. That will make you famous forever. And by the way, Marie has also been charged with murder. 
I'm afraid you won't even have a chance to see her for the last time. And Justin isn't doing any better. This will make the reporters go crazy. Natalia looked at Carl's face getting whiter and whiter, and her eyes became more and more angry. She continued, You gave up on Justin early anyway, didn't you? Carl, did you really think you were a successful man? Look at what's happened to you. You are lonely. You are caged like an animal. That isn't a life worth living anyway. Even if you are sentenced to death, I promise you that Barry and I will never defend you in any way. Are you two not afraid of retribution for your cruel plans of taking me down? Carl asked as his mood seemed to change all of a sudden. Even though he was sitting in a wheelchair with his hands handcuffed, he stood up uncomfortably, his hands fiercely slammed on the table, and his eyes filled with murderous intent. Barry, who had still not spoken, looked up and down at his father at this time. He was very indifferent when he said, Did you really always feel as if Eastgate belonged to you? Even after you stole the inheritances of other families to grow it? He then stood up, grabbed Natalia's hand and turned to leave. After leaving, Barry and Natalia went to visit the graves of Pedro and Cheryl. Carl's actions had been avenged. Natalia seemed to have been saved and liberated. From now on, she and Barry could live for themselves. They would no longer be immersed in getting revenge every day, nor would they be oppressed by Carl. Natalia felt like she could now face the graves with replied happily. But when she saw Pedro's tombstone and the photos on it, she couldn't help but cry. She wished that Pedro was alive to see what they had done. Maybe he could still see it from above? Natalia looked at Pedro's bright smile in the photos, and the feeling in her heart became more and more complicated. In the past, when her mother had been happy, it was due to her thinking about her dead husband. Her mother had never wanted Natalia to forget Pedro, so she had always spoken about him. The time she and her dad had spent together was too short. Most of her memories of him had come from her mother. Only thinking about that now did Natalia feel that her mother had been kind and gentle, and that her father had loved them both so much. He had always taken care of them. And though he lost everything and was framed, he never gave up. No matter how difficult things were, as long as they had been together, Pedro had felt that they would get through the difficulties. As long as they were together, money didn't matter. He had been an exceptional man. Barry noticed the change in Natalia's mood, and he tightly grasped her hand, and then knelt down in front of the grave. Sir, I will always treat Natalia well. I will love her, protect her, and make her happy always. Thank you and your wife for letting me have her, Barry said in a deep voice. Then he looked at Natalia and said to her in a soft voice, Natalia, I will never leave you. Natalia pursed her lips as she cried silently. They would always be together. This is how it had been since they first met, and it would never change. No matter what happened, no matter what they were faced with, they would always be together. Because of the public attention, Carl's case quickly moved to court. Since the evidence was conclusive, he was sentenced to death. On the day of the announcement, all the headlines contained pictures of Carl in prison. This was Carl's most sensational day ever, but it was also the last thing he ever wanted to see. After he was sentenced to death, Barry didn't visit Carl again. As for Marie, who had been sentenced to life imprisonment, Barry and Natalia also didn't see her. After that, Barry invited the media for another press conference. He provided a summary of the affairs of the Thompson and Harris families and discussed the entire matter. The grievances of Pedro were finally cleaned up. It was all so sensational, and everything that had been planned for so long was finally over. In order to make up for the uneasiness on the 10th anniversary of Cheryl's death, Barry once again had a get-together. It would be a small party to celebrate her life. After Eric's media interview, the situation at Eastgate continued to improve. At present, all projects were operating normally, and they were also in talks for new projects. 
Barry found reasons to dismiss any employees who had been loyal to Carl. So at present, the entire company was filled with people he could trust. After finishing work one day, Barry and Natalia went to meet Eric and Emily for dinner to thank them for their help in person. They had helped them so much. Although saying thank you didn't quite cut it, they still wanted to do so in person. From the beginning, it had been Eric who had delayed the project, so he waited for Barry to implement his plan. In the follow-up, it was Eric who had supported them. And at a critical moment, Eric had helped them so much. Both Barry and Natalia were thankful, so the least Barry could do was offer to give up some of the profits of their project together. Eric replied to his offer with, Everything has been done according to the contract we signed. There is no need to do anything extra. Barry said in a low voice, This is my wish. I think I should pay a price for the trouble I have caused. Emily interjected with a smile. Well, the conflict with Carl didn't affect either Parker's or Cooper's. Plus, during the whole time, there were no problems because of it. Therefore, we have no reason to accept this concession, do we? Eric was used to talking about business affairs with a straight face. His imposing force was usually, and he was always serious. But Emily was different. She was like a spring sun. Her voice was always gentle, and there was always a faint smile in her eyes. This made people unconsciously relax. Eastgate is in the stage of development, so it is not a good choice to give up profits. It's better to wait for that further development and to look forward to our working together again in the future. Eric added. For a moment, Barry felt full of emotion. He then said earnestly, Okay, if that's what you want, I will continue to work hard on this and any other projects we work on together in the future. Thank you. Natalia stood by the side, smiling to ease the atmosphere. She eventually said, By the way, we bought some toys and clothes for John. Emily, can you help me by giving them to him? I don't want him to forget me. Of course, no problem. And he won't ever forget you. Emily replied softly. The atmosphere in the room was quite relaxed. Emily then asked in a low voice, So where are we with things? What are the next steps for Eastgate? Barry told me that when our project is complete, he is taking me away. The two of us are going to find a remote island and get some good rest. Natalia said with excitement. When Natalia mentioned this, stars seemed to appear in her eyes. She had been waiting so long for a vacation with Barry. And you? It feels like you two never have any time together. How do you do it? Natalia asked with a smile. Natalia had been feeling much relief after the sentencing of Carl. She had even been able to sleep in each morning. She didn't even want to really go to work. She just wanted to lay in bed. Well, believe it or not, although we don't have much spare time, we always find free time to just be with each other. Eric takes me on dates one day a week, and we spend most evenings together. That is what makes it work. Emily said as she smiled, her eyes full of happiness. She and Eric had been together for so long and still really loved each other. Although Eric was very imaginative, Emily was not willing to be outdone. She wanted to make Coopers bigger and better. However, they still found balance. They didn't neglect each other because of their busy careers. On the contrary, they were so busy with their career that every second they got together was extremely precious to them. That's good, Natalia said with admiration. Emily gently smiled at her friend and said, You two are very good together. What you have been through wasn't easy and you made it. After having dinner, Barry and Natalia left the restaurant and Eric and Emily drove home too. On the way, Emily said to Eric, Although Natalia seemed relaxed, the two of them still have a lot to deal with. I can tell she is very committed to Barry though. I just hope that they aren't bound by their shared hatred of Carl. If they can't let that go, it could impact their future together. During their meal, Natalia had said a lot about her relationship with Barry. That Carl was Barry's father, but Natalia had never said anything about that relationship. Barry may seem chill, but is smart. They will be okay, Eric said in a low voice. Emily nodded with a smile and replied, Yes, I just hope they can truly move on. 
back home, Emily opened the door and heard John's laughter right away. She and Eric looked at each other and then looked in the direction of the living room. John was sitting on the couch watching TV with the remote control in his hand. Cindy was beside him. Beside them were several paintings, some of which appeared to be new and some of which were older. Emily and Eric put down the things in their hands and John finally noticed they were in the room. When the little guy saw his parents, his eyes immediately brightened. He wanted to run over and greet them, but he was also reluctant to miss what was happening on the TV. Finally, he got up and ran towards them and ran to Emily's arms with a smile on his face. Dad, Mom, you're back at last, he said. John was so much taller these days. He seemed to be getting so big, but was always like a child in Emily's eyes. John held Emily's hand and said with a smile, What did you bring me? On the table is a gift from Aunt Natalia. Emily replied as she rubbed the little guy's head. Every time she saw John, she couldn't control her love for him, especially when she heard John call her mother, which she thinks is the most beautiful word in the world. To her, he is the greatest gift of all. By the way, where are grandfather and great-grandfather? Emily asked as she looked around and didn't see them. The two men were always around. Levi and Cindy were often together, talking with John about the latest trends in the painting world. It's not too hot today, so they went out together. They said they wanted to relax. But I did hear that they might be preparing to go to an art exhibition. I'm not very clear about the details. John said as he opened his gift, and his smile gradually deepened. John was getting older, but he was still so handsome. When he smiled, his two deep dimples shone, and he always smiled with his eyes narrowed, making him look adorable. His thick eyelashes constantly flickered, and his happiness was contagious. Oh? They're going to Paris for an exhibition? Did Levi tell you about it, Cindy? Emily asked. Cindy sighed helplessly and replied, Yes, don't you know? In addition to the one at the end of the year, the biggest exhibition and award ceremony in the painting world is next month. Not only will my grandfather go, but I will also be finishing my work here and going to prepare for it soon. Cindy's face was clearly full of reluctance when she spoke as if she was worried about something. Aunt Cindy is afraid that Uncle Damon will ignore her. She doesn't really want to go. John suddenly blurted out. Emily picked up her eyebrows. She had almost forgotten about the exhibition and award ceremony. What about Nikki? Is she going to take part? Emily asked. Cindy nodded and replied. Of course. Nikki is now the most famous painter in Paris. Her talent is limitless. And she is popular among many people. How could she not attend? Aunt Cindy and Aunt Nikki are shortlisted for the same award. Aunt Cindy seems to be worried about it. She doesn't want to lose to Aunt Nikki. John explained. Emily kissed John's nose and asked, How do you know all of this? Because Aunt Cindy and I are good friends. Friends are to help each other solve their problems. He replied. Cindy turned off the TV and walked towards John, staring at the little guy and asking him, Are you talking about me again? Don't good friends keep secrets? I didn't tell them about Damon, I swear. John replied and he stretched out his hands and made a vow to heaven. When he said this, Cindy immediately blushed and Emily couldn't help but laugh. Emily thought about it and wondered if maybe going to Paris would be a good opportunity for her and Eric to take a vacation. When she heard Natalia say she was going away with Barry, she was a bit envious, but they had no time to do that themselves. After all, work was busy for them both. But maybe Paris would be a chance to get away. Do you want to go to Paris, Eric? We could go with Levi and my dad. Plus, John could attend the exhibition and get to know more painters. Emily said as she gently tapped on John's nose. John's eyes really brightened up. Really? I can go? Of course. Emily replied with a laugh. The little guy really loved painting. She was his mother, so of course she would support him. After a while, Levi and Mr. Cooper got home. The two were doing better and better these days. They had both left behind the misunderstandings of the past 
and they have become very fond of each other. They spent a lot of their time immersed in the art world. Hello, Emily, Mr. Cooper said as he smiled happily. He then added, How is everything going at work? It sounds like the big project is continuing, and the mess with Carl hasn't impacted that. Emily nodded with a smile and replied, Yes, it is all good. By the way, when do you leave for Paris? Suddenly, Levi sighed, and his face showed a complex expression. Well, although he would like to go with me, he isn't. He can't leave John because it makes him too sad. I am also sad about it, but I have no choice. He explained. It's okay, though, because Mom promised to take me to Paris. I can go with you now. John immediately said as he ran to Levi's side and smiled at Mr. Cooper. Both men became very excited. Levi said, Really? Emily, you said this? I did. We are still discussing it, though. When do you leave? Emily asked as she looked at Eric and saw that there was no opposition in his eyes. So she added, Since you have a lot to deal with over there, maybe you go first and we will follow? Yes, I leave in two days, Levi said. Now that he knew that John was going to Paris with him, he was in a good mood immediately. Levi began to pack up his things after their conversation. Meanwhile, John and Eric hung out, and Emily went to the studio to help Levi pack. Emily and Levi chatted while packed. Levi said, At the beginning of the year, I was told that we should hold a painting competition again to give more young people the chance to compete. Actually, I should retire at my age. Plus, I want to be with you and John. But I always worry about not providing those opportunities to all the young talent out there. Well, if that is what you want to do, you should. Emily said softly. She then added, And we will always be here. You can come back and visit us anytime. And when I have time, I will take him to visit you. Levi appreciated her support and relaxed a bit. He then said, well, as long as all the young people don't think that I am just an old man, it might be something I should do. Honestly, I would like to show the entire art world that I still have what it takes. And when I think about it, the most impactful thing I've done in the past few years was to hold that competition, especially since it brought you and John back to me. Speaking of this matter raised thousands of feelings for Emily. At first, she had been involved with Levi because of their common interests that things had evolved and it had turned into so much more. Most importantly, the misunderstanding that had been made between him and her mother had been resolved after so many years. By the way, what is the matter with Eric? I have waited for the good news from both of you and yet you are still not getting married. Do you ever intend to? Levi suddenly asked. For him, the most important thing was to see Emily happy. He liked Eric and knew that he treated Emily well but he wanted to see them make it official. Emily was silent for a long time. To her and Eric, there was no difference between them getting married or not. They both felt that their feelings for each other were authentic and that they didn't need a marriage certificate to show for it. But lately, Eric hadn't brought it up at all. As a matter of fact, even when Emily tried to talk about it, she didn't get any response. It seemed that Eric really didn't want to get married at all. Well... Eric and I now have a child. We live together. Really, it's no different than if we were married. Emily finally said. She really didn't want to talk about her recent concerns with him, especially because she didn't want to make Eric look bad. So she added, I have confidence in my relationship with him as it is. Levi looked at Emily and replied, I'm just worried that you are wronging yourself. No way! You think too much. Emily said with a laugh. She then said, Even if Eric never marries me, I would not be wronged. You can rest assured that both feel as if we are married, and a piece of paper doesn't matter to us at all. The relationship between us will only get better and better. Levi sighed. Well, okay. I just want you to be happy. Thank you, I know. Emily said as she nestled into Levi's arms. After discussing the trip to Paris, Emily began to make plans to leave. Lately at Cooper's, she only needed to be responsible for final decision-making, as she had a complete set of processes in place and a team that she trusted fully. 
In her work with Eric, had learned a lot about how to efficiently delegate. She had been working less and was mostly focused on feature development. She didn't really need to be at the office every day because of this. Estelle and Jimmy were both back in the office, so she really wouldn't have to worry too much about work while she was gone. Estelle was doing so much better. Her face was no longer pale as it was before. Emily thought about it and said to Eric with a smile, I am excited about this trip. Won't it be great? Yes. He replied with a smile. He then added, You have arranged such a luxurious trip for us. I am looking forward to it. Emily had told Eric that she wanted to go to Paris to be with her dad and Levi and to bring John to the art exhibition. But she also had another plan up her sleeve. The next day at Cooper's, Emily said to Estelle, Our market has always been here, but I want to try to branch out into the European market. Estelle laughed and said to her jokingly, You want to compete with Mr. Parker? Yes. Emily nodded without hesitation, but she was smiling. She then added, I don't want to not try just because he also has work in that market. Does he know that you want to be in that market? If he did, he would probably give it all up for you, she said. But Emily retorted, That's no fun. I want fair competition because I want Cooper's to be the biggest there is. Are you scared? The two looked at each other and laughed. Of course they were joking. The gap between Cooper's and Parker's was visible to the naked eye, and it wasn't a gap that could be closed just by opening up an overseas market. Emily just wanted to make Cooper's as big as possible. Why do I feel as if you have become much softer than before? Emily suddenly asked her friend. Estelle sighed and replied softly. Jimmy proposed to me. You and Eric are together, but choose not to get married. I used to think that he and I had known each other for so many years that there wouldn't be a difference between just being together and actually getting married. But from the moment he put the ring on my fingers, it seems as if things had completely changed. We get along with each other even better, and I feel as if our love has grown. She was a little embarrassed being so emotional, so she then added, before I was always alone, and I only thought about myself. But now I think about him before I make a decision. It's not a burden. It's a feeling like there's someone behind me whom I'm responsible for. I have that support from him, too. I can fail. I can make mistakes. I can have moments of weakness. Because he will always be behind me. Emily's face showed a yearning look when she heard this. She used to be okay with not marrying Eric. But after her conversations with Levi and now with Estelle, she felt as if she was yearning for marriage all of a sudden. Plus, what girl didn't fantasize about having a wedding? What's the matter? Is everything okay with Eric? Estelle asked tentatively. Emily immediately replied, Oh, yes, everything is great. We don't even ever have arguments. You never argue? Jimmy and I seem to have a small quarrel every day and a big one every three days. Sometimes the fights make us closer, though. Estelle said with a smile. Emily asked suspiciously. Really? In her mind, she imagined her fighting with Eric, but she couldn't even imagine it. She said, I can't even imagine fighting with Eric. Plus, what would we even fight about? But Emily seemed sad, and Estelle knew her friend well. Estelle said, do you want to get married? Is that why you seem upset? Have you ever told Eric that? Emily sighed. No, no. How could I take the initiative to say something like that? Besides, I always wonder if he may have his own plan to surprise me, and I don't want to pressure him. Estelle looked at her and said, I used to think that you were the one in control, but now it seems that it is him. Maybe you need to say something to him about it if that's how you feel. However, Emily was afraid to rock the boat. So when she saw Eric that evening, she observed him closely. Really, after being with him for so long, one would think the magic had faded. But Emily still got butterflies the moment she saw him. At this time, Eric had just finished an important meeting. He was wearing a custom-made black suit which showed off his perfect figure well. His waist looked slim, his legs looked long, 
and his chest look broad. The color black also highlighted Eric's unique energy. He looked as if he had walked out from the page of a magazine. He was totally different than ordinary people. He stood out. Emily had thought about it again and again, but she still felt that Eric's appearance was the most top-notch and handsome she had ever seen. What would you like to eat? Eric asked as he looked at her enchanted expression, raised his eyebrows and rubbed her head with a smile. Emily couldn't focus on food, so she left him to choose. Eric took her to a restaurant. After they finished eating, he asked her, Why are you so absent-minded tonight? Is something going on at work? No, Emily replied. Eric asked again, So what's wrong then? Emily carefully observed Eric's look and found that he seemed to be in a good mood, so she whispered, Estelle and Jimmy are back. I think Estelle looks much better, and they both look happier than ever. Emily knew that this wasn't enough, so she added, She also showed me her ring. It is beautiful. Oh, yeah? Don't you have a beautiful ring, too? Why didn't you have it on? Eric asked with a smile. Emily looked at him and couldn't speak. If there hadn't been an accident, would Eric have proposed at that time? Because of the accident, she received a beautiful diamond ring from him. But it had been at the most painful time of her life, and he hadn't proposed. After she had recovered her memories, though, she didn't wear it again. Because she had thought that one day Eric would put it on her finger in a different way. But what did that mean? Maybe Eric was planning to give her another ring. Emily blinked. She felt that maybe this was a possibility. I... She opened her mouth but could not say anything. Eric didn't seem to notice the change in her mood. He changed the subject and asked, Have you arranged everything for Paris? They'll go ahead of us, right? We should be able to catch up with them at the art exhibition. Have you thought about working with Nikki at all? Also, I am planning on coming a few days after you, if that's okay. Whatever you want. Emily said sullenly, and then looked at Eric's expression, which didn't give anything he was thinking away at all. She became more sad and quiet. Eric seemed to realize that something was wrong for sure, so he asked her softly again. Is everything really okay at work? Or are you stressed? If you want, I can move my plans around and go with you to Paris. Eric seemed annoyed all of a sudden, and Emily wasn't sure why. Although she had expectations and yearning for a proposal and marriage, wasn't the most important thing that she and Eric were together? What's more, Eric always took everything her into consideration, and he treated her as if she were his wife. Although he hadn't mentioned marriage for a long time, Maybe it was because he thought it was unnecessary. And Eric was always so busy, but he still took time to take her out to dinner. She shouldn't be angry at him. Emily sighed and whispered to Eric, Sorry I am acting angry. I have a lot on my mind and have been a bit absent-minded. I'm thinking about something else, and you don't have to change your plans for me. It's okay. Her voice was very low, which was her unique way of acting coquettish. Eric looked at her and asked, Was that anger? Wasn't it? Emily asked. She didn't understand why Eric had asked that. You are always so gentle, he said as he held her hand and added, If you are angry, you can scold me all you want, but there is one condition. What's that? Emily asked. Eric gently touched the tip of her nose and replied, Just don't ever ignore me. And please be honest with me. Anything else is okay. But tell me what you want or what you have on your mind. Whatever it is, we can face it together. Emily once again felt that Eric was really too much. He was always so kind and considerate with her. He cared about her so much. She didn't have to get married. It didn't matter if he proposed. Emily bit her lip and made up her mind. Nothing was more important than just being with him. With this thought, Emily looked at Eric with love in her eyes and said, I think I love you too much. Eric picked up his eyebrows and said, Oh, really? Then what should I do about that? Because I think I love you more than you love me. I am always thinking about you. I wonder how I could possibly love you so much. 
when I see you, I can't help myself. Emily blushed as she nestled into Eric's arms, with a silly smile on her face. A few days later, Levi was making his final preparations to go to Paris with John and Cindy. Eric had personally arranged their plane and their car for pickup upon their arrival in Paris. When he said goodbye, Levi had a reluctant expression on his face as he sighed and said, I feel like I have come alive again during this period of time of being back home. I am not sure I can even bear leaving right now. Emily gently comforted him and said, We will be there in a few days, and you come back any time you wish once you are done in Paris. Yes, I'll be with you. You can't go. Why don't you think about how much you are going to have when we get there? John said excitedly. He can hardly wait. John then quickly gave Emily a kiss on her cheek and said, Mom, I'll be waiting for you in Paris. I will call you every day and will be thinking about you the whole time. Oh yeah? Even when you are having so much fun? Emily asked him with a smile. John replied, I will still be missing you. Well, I hope you have lots of fun and I will miss you too. Emily said as she kissed his forehead. She then added, Take good care of yourself. Dad and I will see you soon. John then looked at Eric and said, Dad, take good care of my mom, and you must remember to miss me too. Meanwhile, Cindy and Damon were also saying goodbye. Damon looked down at his feet and drooped his mouth. He looked obviously unhappy. You really can't come? Cindy asked in a low voice. She didn't look up because she couldn't bear to see the expression on Damon's face. There are some things I have to deal with here, but it'll be okay. We can video every day. I promise to call you every day too. Besides, didn't you say that too? Plus, your career needs your attention, he said. Cindy raised her head and looked at him discontentedly. She said, Are you happy I am leaving? Yes, I care about my career, but it feels like you just want me to go, don't you? After I'm gone, you can do whatever you want and you won't have to worry about making time for me, right? What? Damon replied in surprise. Damon saw that Cindy was in a hurry to leave. He quickly said, After you are gone, I will still be buying the food you like to eat every day. After buying it, I will eat it alone while I am thinking about you. I will miss you every moment but I want you to focus on your art and know that I am waiting for you. Really? Cindy said. The dissatisfaction on her face had suddenly disappeared, and the corners of her mouth even rose gently. With a smile, Damon gently stroked her hair and replied, Yes. Plus, I'm really looking forward to seeing how your exhibition goes. If you want to be the best painter of our time, I will support you. Cindy laughed. She then took Damon's hand in hers and shook it, as if they were saying a formal goodbye, just in case anybody was looking. She said, Well, take good care of yourself. You will have a good rest after I leave. She then added with a whisper, But don't drink too much, and most importantly, you know blind dates, okay? You are the only woman for me, the only one in my heart. Damon replied with a smile, Cindy lowered her head again and said, Then remember to miss me and call me every day. Damon smiled and gave her a huge hug. Goodbyes were always hard. When Emily saw John get on the plane and wave to her, she couldn't help but get tears in her eyes. Since they had met each other, they had been close. At the thought of not seeing John over the next few days, Emily's heart immediately felt empty. But the little guy couldn't wait to get to Paris. Emily could only smile and wave, even if her heart was breaking. After seeing them off, Damon drove Emily back to the office and then went back to Parker's with Eric. When they arrived at the office, Damon, who had been carefully observing Eric's expression, said in a low voice, May I ask for leave when you are in Paris? I will take care of work in advance and will not miss anything. Eric turned to look at him and replied, I am going to Paris. How would that work? Damon hesitated and didn't dare to speak more. Unexpectedly, Eric had refused him. Damon had really wanted to surprise Cindy by also going to Paris, but that didn't seem to be an option. Well, could you maybe give me two days off? 
Damon finally asked. He then added, Cindy is in Paris because it is important to her. She's going to have an exhibition and I want to be the first to see her work. After that, Damon took a deep breath. He seldom asked Eric for time off. This time, he really wanted to make Cindy happy, so he added, I won't take off time for the holidays or even next summer. You don't need time off because I cannot go to Paris without you, or Cindy will make a lot of trouble for me. I've already arranged work for us over there, including a plan to give you a few days off. If you accompany me to Paris, you will not only be able to see Cindy, but you will also be able to work with me on matters there. I will need you to accompany me for most of the time I am there in order to get everything done. Eric suddenly said. He then smiled at Damon, happy that his joke had been successful. Damon was stunned for a moment before he started to laugh. Because she was anxious to go to Paris with Eric, Emily quickly made arrangements. With the idea of marriage no longer a concern, the most important thing for her was to have Eric around. In the evening, because he missed her, Emily and John had a video call. Emily listened to the little guy talking excitedly on the phone about what he had done and eaten so far in Paris. Emily was happy to see him so happy, but when he was going to hang up the call, John's eyes filled with tears. He whispered, Mom, I miss you. Can you come here quickly? I want to be with you and have you to take me to eat delicious food. Emily's eyes immediately filled with tears, but she quickly comforted him. She said, I also miss you. Your father and I will rush over as soon as possible, okay? John tearfully looked at Emily and asked, Does dad miss me? He didn't call me today. Does he really like that I'm not around? Emily looked at him and felt sad. She quickly said to him, How could he not miss you? Your father missed you as much as I do, but he's been very busy today. We have to wait for things to calm down before we come to you, okay? John took a deep breath and showed a helpless expression. He replied, Fine, then I reluctantly forgive him. But mom, you can't tell dad that I miss him, okay? If he doesn't miss me, then I don't want him to know. Okay, he does miss you, but I won't say a word. Emily said with a smile. Shortly after, they hung up. Emily looked at her phone and John's sweet face appeared in her mind. Although the little guy was growing up, he was still so sweet with her. Lately, she often hoped that the time would pass more slowly so that she and John can have more time together. She wanted the little guy to be independent eventually, but she also wanted to make up for the years they had missed out on each other. Meanwhile, Eric was extra busy. He had been leaving early for work, and not returning until very late. Before John left, he had been finding time to accompany her each day. Now he hardly had time to see her at all. At night, Emily usually fell asleep alone. By the time Eric came home, it was early morning. And by the time Emily woke up in the morning, Eric had already rushed off to work again. Emily thought he was trying to deal with as much work as soon as possible so that they could leave sooner for Paris. So today, she took the time to go to Parker's to see if she could help. She had just finished a meeting herself. After the follow-up work was explained, she drove to Eric's office from the company, stopped to grab them some lunch, and continued. Because everyone was familiar with Emily, she didn't stop at the front desk on her way up to his office. She headed right up and knocked on the door as she opened it. At a glance, she saw Damon, who was obviously flustered. He was both quickly putting something away. The atmosphere was immediately awkward. Damon looked embarrassed, he said. Miss Cooper, you are here. I'll go out to do my work now. He then carefully took the thing he had just hidden in his hand and quickly left the office. Emily looked suspiciously at what Damon had in his hand, but she didn't say anything about it. After he left, she put the food box on the table and said to Eric with a smile, Special delivery. We have to eat while it's still hot. By the way, the chef where I got this has even better cooking skills than yours. Eric had already gotten up and walked slowly up to Emily. He encircled her in a hug and then lightly kissed her lips. He then said, Are you not very busy? Yes, but you still have to eat, don't you? Emily asked. 
she noticed that Eric's face didn't look as tired as she imagined, which was good. I don't ever see you these days. What are you doing? Emily asked tentatively. Eric lifted his eyebrows and replied, Dealing with the domestic affairs so that I can go to Paris with you soon. That's it? Is it just that simple? Is there anything I don't know? Emily asked him pointedly. Damon had obviously been flustered when he saw her, and he had hidden something. It had made Emily feel suspicious, and she was more curious about what it was he had been hiding. Of course, Eric said. Emily didn't continue to press it, but if she didn't believe in Eric's feelings for her, she would have doubted what he was really hiding from her. After she let it go, Emily served Eric the food she had brought. The food was delicious. Emily laughed and joked and said, It seems that his culinary skills have surpassed yours. Are you sure about that? Eric looked at her and asked in a challenging tone. The expression on his face clearly said that he was giving her another chance to change her mind. Emily coughed quickly and solemnly said, Of course, in my heart, the food you cook is always the best. No one can actually surpass it. Eric looked at her with satisfaction. After tasting another mouthful of food, he said with a light smile, It's not so bad. After nearly a week's work, Eric and Emily finally managed to deal with all the things that had to be done at work. Emily took advantage of the week to talk about two new medium-sized projects with Estelle and Damon. She then confirmed that Estelle would be in charge of their existing projects in her absence. She also officially promoted both Estelle and Damon so that they could have more say in the company. After all of it, she couldn't wait to board the plane to Paris with Eric. Although they had been talking via video every day, Emily still missed John a lot. She had even regretted their decision to let him go ahead of her for many nights. Why had they done that? They should have gone with him. But now that she was about to see him again, Emily was so excited that she couldn't even sleep well. After landing in Paris, Emily saw John waiting for them. It had only been one week, but it had felt like forever. She ran towards the little guy. John ran to her with the same excitement, and they hugged each other tightly. Mom, you're here at last! I've been waiting for you! John said as he held on to her. He couldn't let go. Eric, who seemed to have been forgotten by them both, walked up to Fontaine and Nikki, nodded and said hello. John has been on the edge of his seat since the moment he found out you were coming today. Last night he even called for you both in his sleep. He missed you, Nikki said with a smile. Eric smiled as he looked at Emily doting on their son. At this time, Emily took the little guy's hand and walked up to the group. John then quietly walked up to Eric's side, grabbed onto his clothes, looked up and asked, Dad, don't you want to tell me anything? Eric looked at him. The little seemed to have grown taller lately, but he was still far from his height. However, he had changed so much from the young baby, who once could only cry in his arms, to now. Usually, Eric would make a joke, but at the moment he couldn't. So Eric bent down and picked up his son. He said to him in a low voice, I miss you, darling. John immediately laughed. The happiness was clear in his eyes. Looking at the father and son, Emily laughed and then looked back at Nikki and Fontaine. She then gave Nikki a hug and said, Long time no see. You're here at last, said Nikki. It was also difficult for Nikki to hide her excitement at Emily's arrival. Emily touched Nikki's hair and said with a smile, Wow, I barely recognize you. What a big change. Nikki had changed so much since Emily last saw her. Although Emily hadn't been to Paris for a long time, she followed Nikki's every move. Naturally, she knew how much Nikki had achieved in the six months since she last saw her. Her success was written all over her. Moreover, it seemed that Nikki and Fontaine had grown even closer than before and there was an aura of love surrounding them. I have so much to tell you. Let's go. Everyone else is waiting for you. Nikki said. She then took Emily's hand in hers with a smile. Behind them, Eric was holding John's hand and chatting with Fontaine about the recent trends in Paris. Emily found that everyone was even livelier than she had imagined they would be 
when the group was reunited. Because Sharna was also there, whom they haven't seen for a long time, Emily was even more happy to be there. Sharna still looked as young as always. It was great to see. We are so happy you are here. Sharna said to them with a smile. She then added, I can thank you in person now for taking such good care of Cindy while she was away. I heard that she'd even found a man. Her father and I are so happy. It was our pleasure. We enjoy taking care of her. Emily replied. Levi saw them come in and immediately came over with a smile too. The whole family suddenly was together, but Cindy, who had been watching them all reunite, seemed to be a bit upset. Only Emily and Eric had come in the door. She thought that Damon would surprise her and show up too. But he hadn't come. Cindy clasped her hands together. The more she thought about it, the more disappointed she was. She even had the crazy idea of going back home to return to Damon's side. In the middle of the living room, Emily gave everyone some gifts she had brought. Cindy heard Emily call her name, so she immediately tried to hide her unhappy expression and walked up to her side. Yes? Cindy said. Emily took out a gift bag with a smile and put it in Cindy's hand. She said, This is from Damon. He asked me to bring it to you. He said you would miss this. Cindy was surprised and widened her eyes. She couldn't wait to open it. But she looked at the people around her, closed the bag calmly and simply said, Thank you. But she briskly walked away a moment later. Cindy, where are you going? I want to see what's in it too. Sharna immediately joked and said with a smile, but Cindy quickened her pace, ignored the laughter behind her, and carefully held her gift as she walked to her bedroom. After settling down, Nikki said, The award recipient is determined in about three days, and they are reviewing now. However, because of confidentiality, the judges themselves don't even know who will win. After that, there will be an art exhibit. Ah, oh, the pressure is so great. Why? Isn't it a good thing either way? Generally speaking, your popularity will be improved, and your exhibit will definitely attract more attention. Emily said. As a bystander, she could see at a glance that no matter what, Nikki's future was only looking to get better and better, and all of her previous efforts were paying off. You don't get it. The media likes to compare me with Cindy. Nikki said. She seemed angry. She then added, We are sisters. We are family, so they just won't let it go. Emily suddenly realized the issue and said, Oh, you are afraid of losing to Cindy? Not really, but have you seen her latest work? Nikki asked in a low voice. Her voice was filled with wonder. Emily nodded and replied, Yes, I saw one or two pairs but I didn't see the complete series. But her ideas were very good, and her talent definitely shows. Nikki immediately sighed and said, Right, I feel the same way when I see them, and obviously I can see the gap between us, so I never feel like I can catch up with her or compare to her, but the media likes to make it worse with their nonsense. Emily understood Nikki's frustration and smiled to comfort her. Nikki smiled back. She then said, I can tell that her work has really changed a lot lately. However, I have been participating in many exhibitions and have been working to improve my talent. I feel like I will never be enough for my family when compared to her. Really? Emily asked as she showed a surprised look on her face. In the family, Cindy was like a princess. She was born directly into the family. She was loved and cherished by them as she grew up. She was gifted. She had enjoyed achievements that many people would never achieve in their lifetime. So naturally, she was also confident and arrogant, and she did her best to get what she wanted. Nikki sighed and said softly, So, are you going to participate in the exhibition? Because Emily was so busy with Cooper's, she hadn't been focusing on her art at all. It would be impossible for Emily to participate because she was so behind. But Nikki had made special arrangements for her in advance. Nikki said, I have arranged a place for you in my exhibition hall spot. I really want to see your latest work. I feel that many people are also looking forward to it. I thought about it. 
If I do this time, I want to do something really different, Emily said. It was clear that she had a specific idea. Nikki asked expectantly, What's your idea? Let me hear it. I want to create a painting with John, Emily said with a smile. Anytime she mentioned John, the smile on her face immediately became gentle. It was the kind of smile belonging to a mother. Doing a piece of art had been a wish of hers for a long time. Since she knew that John also had great artistic talent, she had always wanted to find a chance to create something with him. Well, the studio is ready and waiting for you, Nikki said. She looked even more excited than Emily. After their talk, Emily went to talk with the little guy about her idea. Of course, John was very happy when he heard it. He seldom saw his mother's art and more often worked with Cindy and Levi. When Emily brought it up, John opened his eyes excitedly and couldn't speak for a long time. After a long time, his voice trembled as he said, What are we going to draw? Emily rubbed John's head and replied, You can draw anything you want. Can I arrange the layout? Am I dreaming? John asked. He then rubbed his eyes and shook his head to wake up from his dream, but he still couldn't believe it. Emily laughed and replied, I'm your mother, and I would work with you anytime. Since this will be the first time we've worked together, I want to be more formal about our arrangement, though. With that, she held out her hand and solemnly said, May I ask you, John, to give me a chance to work with you? I believe that we could create what might be most precious work. John stood up excitedly, held his breath, and firmly grasped Emily's hand. He said seriously in reply, Thank you, Mom, for being willing to give me a chance. I will do the best I can. After the mother and son agreed on the idea, Emily hugged the little guy with a smile and then said to him softly, Don't be too nervous about it. It will be fine. I am not the best artist out there, but I know we can make something special. You are the best in my heart, John replied. Emily's eyes lit up. The family was staying in the Huntsman house while in Paris. Sharna had chosen a room for everyone, and John had his own room. But tonight the little guy really wanted to sleep with his mother. So Eric could only sleep in the room Sharna had prepared for John. My father is so generous that he lets me sleep with my mom. But are you mad about it? John asked his dad as they prepared for bed. After his success, John immediately became proud. But when he thought about it, he was worried. Eric looked back at him and asked, What do you think? I don't think so. Dad is the best dad in the world. He is generous and handsome. He won't haggle me. John said as he jumped up and down on the bed. Eric looked at him helplessly, with only love in his eyes. In the middle of the night, Cindy couldn't sleep. She looked at the gift bag, which was still on the table. It held handmade desserts that she loved. It was hard to find them anywhere, but Damon was always thinking of ways to please her. This time had been no exception. The desserts were delicious, and she appreciated them, but she really wanted to see Damon more. Although she had been a little disappointed that he hadn't come, Cindy knew that Damon had always been a career-oriented man and that he wasn't one to miss work for personal reasons. When they had first been together, she had thought it was because she wasn't very important to him, but later she had learned to understand Damon better, so she knew that work was simply very important to him, just like her art was to her. So she had learned to understand and respect that, which had helped them to get along more harmoniously. Although there were still sometimes stumbling blocks, things were much better than at the beginning. Cindy missed him, but she would never force Damon to come. Since he couldn't, the day before the exhibition began, she took some pictures to share with him. She wanted him to see her work before anyone else. Cindy sent the pictures to him via text. A moment later, the cell phone rang. It was Damon. At this time, it was early morning at home. Had Damon just finished work? He must be so tired. Cindy quickly picked up. Cindy, Damon began. But before he finished, Cindy immediately interrupted him as she said in a low voice, I received the desserts and they are delicious. 
Please go home and get some rest. What is Eric thinking working you so hard? He comes to Paris while he puts all his work on you? I'll go to him tomorrow and ask for an explanation. He can't bully you like that. Cindy wanted to make sure that Damon was getting rest and that he was working too hard. I am fine. Why are you still up? Damon asked. Cindy whispered. I'm going to bed now. Can you see the moon where you are? I can see it here. It's beautiful. Damon then said softly. After hearing this, Cindy got up from bed and went to the window. She originally wanted to see the moon at the same time Damon did. But when she got to the window, she saw the man himself standing outside. Cindy immediately clenched her mobile phone and widened her eyes. She couldn't believe she was actually seeing him standing there under the moonlight. Damon! Damon's figure was covered by the moonlight. Instead of wearing as he usually did, he was wearing jeans with a blue shirt that Cindy had bought for him. His slender legs were wrapped in his light-colored jeans, which made him look very young. When she spotted him, he lifted his phone and stared into her eyes. For a moment, Cindy forgot how to even speak, and she didn't know what to do. Just looking at Damon, her heart was filled with so many feelings that she couldn't describe. Then she finally got a hold of herself and ran out the door into Damon's arms. Cindy gasped as she looked at Damon in front of her in disbelief. Holding his hand, she whispered, Is it really you? Are you really here? Am I dreaming? Damon smiled and gave her a kiss. He replied, It's really me. I'm here. I thought you couldn't come. I thought you weren't coming to my exhibition. Cindy said. She sounded a little angry, which surprised her. Her heart clenched at her words. If I didn't come, would you have been so angry that you wouldn't ever want to see me again? Damon asked her with a smile. He knew Cindy well. She would have been livid. But he also wanted to see her exhibition. How could he miss it? Maybe, Cindy said with a smile. She then laughed again and said, How long are you here? I was hoping you would come with Emily and Eric. I was going to come with them, but I wanted to surprise you, so I came a few days later. As for when I am going back, Eric arranged everything so that we could work from here for a while. So I am not leaving anytime soon. Damon replied. Cindy's eyes suddenly brightened as she said with great interest. Did you come by plane on a red eye? You must be exhausted. Why don't you sleep for a while? Come in and I'll get you settled. However, Damon didn't move. What's the matter? Cindy asked with a puzzled look. Damon raised his eyebrows held her in his arms with a smile, and said in a low voice, I can't stay in your family home with you. Besides this, you can't tell everyone that I am here, especially Emily. Why? Cindy asked blankly. She then asked, What are you hiding from Emily? Damon nodded mysteriously and whispered something into Cindy's ear. Cindy was shocked. She looked up at Damon and said, Wait, so you came for that? not for me? Of course not, Damon said. He then added, as soon as you left, I asked Eric for leave. Originally, I planned to take a few days off to see you, but Eric arranged for us to work from Paris. Thanks to him, I will be here with you longer. Is that true? Cindy asked, half squinting and still looking suspicious. Damon took her hand and whispered, of course it is but I have already reserved a hotel and can't stay here with you, so I could only ask you to stay with me in the hotel. Is that okay, little princess? Damon had called her little princess with a smile and doting look on his face. Cindy pursed her mouth but couldn't force herself to say no, so she nodded her head obediently.